So thank you, first of all, Dr. Maria, Dr. Hawkins, for the invitation. Every time my phone um, has your name pop up, I get excited because you are very fortunate to have a professor who's always thinking of new ideas and new thoughts. And we never have to, I don't know how many years we're into doing this. I think it's becoming an annual tradition um, to the point where this year I'm texting you ahead of time like, hey, I'm looking forward to talking with your class. So uh, every year she gives me a different prompt based on you and who you are and what you need specifically which is different from last year's class, which is different from the year before and the year before that. So specifically for this class, um, first of all, welcome to the next chapter of your life, right? Because how many of you know people who had big dreams as a child and you grew up with them and for whatever reason, they're not still on that path towards pursuing their heart's desire? But you are. Even if you're not quite sure what it is or you've taken different turns and it's molded into different things, you're still here, which means you're waking up, you're doing things you don't want to do, you're making sacrifices, you're watching people make money that you're like, wait a minute, why are they living a, that life and I'm over here struggling in college? And sometimes it may not add up, but you still nevertheless wake up every day or stay up late type that paper, go to the library, pursue resources, walk in the rain to be here. And that's not taken lightly. We all know what it's like to park on one side of campus and go across the other, have to wake up and catch the bus. Or some of you may even have to go to the grocery store on the bus because your car breaks down and you don't know how you're going to get to point A to point B. So you figure out how to take the bus and even get on the bus with grocery bags been there. So I see you and I acknowledge that for you to be here, take something. And you may not get any credit for it, but you deserve credit for every day, every step you take. Success is a product. Some say it's the sum of blah, 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 but what is a product but a shortcut to a sum? Any dissents on that? Okay, so to me, what is a product but a shortcut to a sum? And so whether you see it as a sum or see it as a product probably depends on what phase you are in the process. And then you'll learn to go from sums to products to exponents. And once you go from sums to products to exponents, now you're cooking and now you're rolling. So right now when you're in the sum phase and things don't even seem like they're adding up, all good, stay the course. You'll, things will start to add up and then after they start to add up, then you'll be able to see the transition into the product phase. And then eventually, Lord willing, you'll see a transition into the exponential phase. And this is a lot of fun. So success, to me, that's what success is. Success is a product or a sum of a lot of luck. But then now what is luck? Because again, everything is semantics. Everything is words. Words, people say words have power. Perhaps the meaning that you ascribe to that word is what gives it the power because we all thought bad was one thing until Michael Jackson came out and gave us a new definition of bad. And of course, it, Michael Jackson got it from somewhere, got it from somewhere, got it from somewhere. And then hence the sum, the product, and the exponent. So a series of lucky successes combined together. And then what is luck? I heard this quote from Arthur Ashe, and Arthur Ashe said, success is when, well, excuse me, when opportunity and preparation intersect. Success is when preparation meets opportunity. And so then I used to meditate on that. I worked at a time, and in my cubicle, I printed that out, and I put it right there 
as soon as I walked into my cubicle, that's the first thing I saw. Success is when preparation meets opportunity. And at the time, I thought it was just a nice quote. And it resonated and it sounded good. And I didn't realize that 20 years later, that would still be my mantra every day. Be prepared and look for the opportunity. See, sometimes people say things like, see the opportunity, you know, or seize the opportunity. Well, yes, but what happens before that? Before you can seize it, you have to see it. But before you can see it, you need to what? If we were all standing on a street corner in Times Square, how many different things would we be able to see? If we were all on the same street corner, give me a number. Hundreds. What are the odds that we would all see the same thing? What are you interested in, sir? Football, okay. You can go or you just be out there playing around? Okay, nice, nice. Side note, segue, there's two things you need in life, and you only need these two. And the sooner you get them, the better you off are. A child needs these. So if you had these as a child, go back, find who gave it to you, or what helped you cultivate it, and never lose that for the rest of your life. Number one is a strong belief in yourself. That's number one. If you don't have that, then a good substitute is someone else with a strong belief in you. But if you have both, the world is yours. Okay, so first standing on the street corner at Times Square, you would probably, as a confident, supported, strong, happy, artistic, creative individual would probably see something different than you, who's had to take the bus. So you may notice the bus system if you, in the past few days, have been on a bus.
need to know how to lock in, tune in, and get it in, and then go apply it. If you want success. So when, my favorite is when people are like, oh, did you um, see the movie, I don't know, Shrek? And I'm like, yeah, I saw it. Like, oh, do you remember when blah, 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 blah? No, I don't remember that. Shrek didn't really mean anything to me. It was just on. opportunity. What you see as opportunity will be different than what another sees as opportunity. So then you go back to, well, how do you discern who to listen to? Because yes, you should take the wise counsel of others. And the only way you know you can trust somebody is to trust them and find out. The only way you can know someone is wise is to pursue them as if they are, perceive them as if they are wise until they tell you otherwise. That's my approach. Some people take the opposite approach and they do the inverse to each their own. Know what works for you. There's no right or wrong way to do anything. Nothing. I've seen it all. All. Let me rephrase that. I've, in what I've seen, I've seen all it all. But of course, there's more to see. So what you see is what you get. How many of you heard that before? Right? If your laptop's open, who would write that down? You'd all write it down. What you see is what you get. I mean, come on. You know that. You know it. You know it intuitively. Or you've heard it. But do you know it? Because after you hear it, then you need to contemplate it. And see, okay, does this apply? My grandmother, the wisest woman in the world, that to me, of course, beyond 100 years old, she says to me, princess, now you know there's three things. I was vexed by something. I was telling her someone was irritating me, you know, so, you know, grandmother, listen to this. So I'm going on and on, just no, 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 no. And she says, she stops me. She says, I don't even know why we're having this conversation. Some things you let go in one ear and out the other. Some things you let in and you process it and you contemplate it. And then you decide, does this go out the other ear? Some things you let in, you process it, you contemplate it and say, you know what? This needs to absorb. She said, but some things you just let bounce off the side of your head and you don't even let them in your space. She said, this is one of those things. So there are things that you may observe, observe that you don't necessarily incorporate. So that's why when it comes to opportunity, you need to intentionally look for opportunity. Look for opportunity. So again, what you see is what you get. You look for the opportunity, the opportunities will be there. And then when the opportunities come, number two, be prepared. Be prepared. You know what opportunities you need. You know you want to play. No, you know you want to play ball. There's a standard that you have. You don't want to just be out there, right? Of course not. Nobody would go through what you do go through as an athlete and professional in every intent of the pur purpose of that word to just be out there for fun. You have goals. And so it's not just for you. And what is your name, sir? Okay. So for Didi, excuse me, there's not a just one goal is a process, it's a series. You do this to then get to this, excuse me, and then to get to this, to get to this. 
each phase along the way. So are you not only prepared for here, but are you prepared for each of the phases along the way? Do you know what steps you need to get the Bronco? Do you know what timing? Who has, name somebody who has a, feels like they have a career aspiration that they feel very strongly about. Okay, who has a career aspiration that they don't feel very strongly about? They have a few floating around, they're not quite sure which one they wanna narrow in on. Raise your hand so I can see. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, who didn't raise their hand for either one and is just chilling? Okay, all right, just along for the ride. Happy to be here. The ones who have the multiple, y'all are the most fun. The most fun. Because that was me. And what I say to that is, do it all. You can, for, you can do as much as you're prepared to do. If you're prepared for it, you can do it. How many of you have ever cooked a dinner? What's the most number, who's ever made a meal that's had more than three dishes? Who's made a meal that has more than four dishes? Five, six, seven, jeez. Okay, so six dishes. So you did all that and you've got to chop this and cook this and boil this and stir this and time this, right? That's a lot. If you have the right tools and you're prepared, is it manageable? Is the second time easier than the third or the fourth and the fifth? Such what kind of football? Have you ever heard of a general manager of a college football team? Ball State just had Elizabeth West, and he got really As a GM? Mm -hmm. Okay. And what was the second thing? Uh, operations and recruitment. Of? MIT Training Okay. And you see operations and recruitment as two different things? No, I'm in it right now for the football team. Okay. So I don't see those as three different things. I see those as all the same thing. Football administration, college football administration. Okay, so if anyone asks you in the business, what are you interested in, college football administration, then they can start to fill in the gaps and plug you into where, and then there's bigger and better things that come after that, which brings us to a phenomenal point. Titles and careers are different. Do not convolute a title with a career. People make up titles. Titles are just words. They just make them up, right? How many teams have you played on? And you, how many titles, random titles, do you see? And then they come in the room. Do, does the title of the person, other than coordinator, which really is more about their behavior than their title, because I'm sure you've seen some coordinators have a title, but perhaps did not, mm-hmm. So do the titles mean anything? Not, not at all. For formalities and what? So as you think about your pursuits for your subsequent chapters, Think about, um, think about the career and not just the title. Dr. Maria, I am so sorry to ask you this, but the weather's getting to me. Is there any way? I, yes, please. Thank you. Look for the opportunities and be prepared. People will say, oh my gosh, you're so lucky, huh? Yeah, I just happened to see what I was looking for. I just happened to get a call from who I was expecting and hoping to get a call from. And then I happened to be prepared when the call came, I happened to be prepared. I didn't just have my phone on do not disturb random and willy nilly because that's the cool thing to do. I actually had my phone on so when the call came through I could actually answer it. Success, luck, preparation, opportunity. Magic formula. Talk to me, what are your questions? 
What do you want in life? What do you want? Yes. Danny Huber, I see our guest. Hi, Danny. Nice to see you. Hi, it's nice to see you too. <laughs> um, what uh, factors in your life really developed your methods of success? Probably more than anything, the Arthur Ashe success quote that I put up in my office. Success is when preparation meets opportunity. That's impacted me more than anything, I would think. Yes? Sam Niger with Ball State Sports Hi, Network. Hi, Sam. How are you? Good. How are you? You're with Ball State Sports Network? Sportslink. Yes. Sportslink, yeah. So you, you mentioned that the best substitute for belief in yourself is somebody else's belief in you. Who was that person for you in your life, and what kind of impact were they making on you? So many people. So many people. I mean, the list is exhaustive. And obviously, you start with, for me, I was fortunate, fortunate um, to start with my mother and my father. And then an extension of them, the first big one would be my grandfather. When I was born, I was very premature. They immediately had to rush me to Children's Hospital. So my mom and dad could not be with me. My dad stayed with my mom. My grandfather went with me to Children's. My grandmother would go back and forth. She was like the runner in between both hospitals. So my dad was with my mom, who was in um, sensitive condition. My grandfather was with me, who was in sensitive condition. And so my grandmother was going back and forth. And so my grandfather's literal belief in me to stay alive started the whole thing. <coughs> That's it. Let's go. Come on, y'all. This is fun. This is, let's go. I'm um, Brandon Beam with Ball State Sports Link. Hi, Brandon. How are you? I'm doing good. How about you? Wonderful. Um, so you've been a GM and a head coach, and you said sometimes those goals aren't, they're just like placeholder title names? No. The titles are titles, not the roles. Okay. The roles are the actions. The titles are the words. Okay. So it's very important to know what role you may have, regardless of title. And if you, is, who here is not in the sports industry or not interested at all? Okay, who else is not in, okay? Who else is not interested in, okay? If the rest of you, if you even take a cursory um, 20 minutes with the team, any team of your choice, you'll be able to see roles in action, what people do, and not just the players, most importantly, the staff, who's doing what, and then it's what you want to do, and then the title that comes, you can make up any title, but is it, what is it that you want to do? Do you want to treat injuries? Okay, then there's 15 titles that go along with treating injuries. Do you want to cultivate financial opportunities for a demographic who you may feel is inherently vulnerable to being exploited. No different than consumers are vulnerable to being exploited by marketers, right? All of you have now things that you have integrated into your life that you would have never imagined, but you are a product of the social environment of which you immerse yourself in period. Immerse yourself in that flow, you're going to get that product. Immerse yourself in a different flow, you're going to get a different product. Perhaps it's worth considering immersing yourself within a flow that has shown to produce the type of product that you wish to resonate with. Keep going with your question. So the roles and the I titles. I think that clears up what I was getting at, so I think that's good. Oh, no problem. Okay, Dee Dee. And let's, if anyone has a question, fire away. If not, I could just stay on Dee Dee all day because the young man is super interesting. Okay. What's next, perhaps? What are three possible chapters that are next? After graduation. Okay. Um, 
NFL is the, my main goal. What okay. I'm working for. Um, being a college coach is also something I want to do. Okay. And being a sports analyst or something like that. Huh? We're twins. <laughs> <laughs> and all three are, are already yours. Those three are already easy, and you've already seen how all three play out. So that's like already happened. Now it's just a matter of you walking it out. Because once you've gotten it to the point where you see it and you see how it's going to happen and how it unfolds and you see, okay, well, in order to be prepared for this, this is this, this is In order to be prepared for this, this is this. So when I was in undergrad, I was a student athlete So for women's basketball. So for the men's basketball games, I would go to the truck, the video truck, and say, hey, can I just sit in the truck and watch and see what's going on? And of course, they're like, sure, come on in. You know, I introduced myself. I didn't really have anyone call on my behalf. I didn't send the emails. I mean, there wasn't even email. I just went to the truck and knocked on the door. They and go early, you know, not while they're setting up and in the middle of the game. And so then um, they said, come back anytime. And I was like, well, you know, I play, so I'm on the road a lot. And just being there, I realized I have no interest in being in sports media behind the scenes. No interest. It was so much going on. I wasn't interested in production, but you have to go and look, look into it to know. But then I saw, well, look at the commentators. They just look like they're having so much fun just talking. And I said, that seems interesting. And lo and behold, all these years later, that's what she gets to do for fun. So all three will play out. What do I need to do to be prepared for this? What do I need to do for 1A? What do I need to be prepared for 1B? What do I need to do to be prepared for 1C? When you go places, you um, meet people. You say hello. You remember their name. You just, even if it's just one person, when you guys go on the road, if it's just one person at the other team's school, maybe it's the guy who greets you, maybe it's the security guard, but just one person, if you can remember that person's name. And what that also does is starts to exercise your mental ability to remember names and faces, right? You just start to practice that because you know throughout the course of your career, this is something that's going to be important. And then when the opportunity comes for me to meet Roger Penske, because I've learned to link names with faces and I'm in an environment, perhaps at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, where it's completely out of context, but because I've learned to match names with faces, when I run into that person, I remember their name and there's a divine opportunity. Hi, Dean. Daniel. Daniel. Um, you've spoken a lot about preparation and, and being prepared. How has that kind of emphasis on preparation helped you in situations where you're not prepared? Or maybe surprises in your life? Great question. You draw on what you do have. How many of you have ever, well, I won't put you on the spot. Oh, yeah, put them on the spot. When I was growing up, there may be times where you just have to make something up in the kitchen because nothing matches and it is what it is. That's all you got. And you just have to pull from what's there and make it work. Dr. Maria talks about my oatmeal story. When I was going through a particular chapter in my life, when I was at the, I left the University of Notre Dame to go overseas to Barcelona to play. And in preparation of going to Barcelona, I was training at the University of Florida with the Gators. Excuse me, my sister played there. So, of course, to put a little change in my pocket, I was working camps. In working camps, uh, so many opportunities came my way to be helpful and to learn something new and to try something new. Well, throughout that, someone, Coach Ross, took note. Coach Ross and Coach Joy, uh, Carol Ross, Joy Williams were driving down and a, a gym needed some basketballs. So they were trying to radio over for somebody to get the go-kart to come back over to go get the basketballs and bring them back to the gym. Well, I realized quickly that I could run to the O-Dome 
faster than us waiting on somebody to answer the walkie-talkie, get in a go-kart, pack up some basketballs and drive them over. So I just took off running. Plus, I'm getting ready to go overseas. It's an extra conditioning for me. That's how I saw it. Oh, I just get a quick little run in. So I just take off running. I sprint to the Odo, put the balls in the bag, put the mesh bag, put the bag over my shoulder, and I start running back to um, the other auxiliary gym. As I'm running back, Coach Ross, who was the head coach, and Coach Williams, who was the associate head coach, pull up in their convertible, looking fabulous, of course. And they said, Am, what are you doing? I said, the gym needs balls. And they said, why didn't you call somebody to have them go-kart? I said, they would take too long. And we have a gym full of kids sitting there. I don't want the kids just sitting there. Just get them some balls so they can get playing. So they just laugh it off. I keep running, take the balls in. Well, they said, you want to ride? Well, but they would have to go around. You know how it is on campus. Sometimes it's easier to just cut through the buildings and you'll get there a lot faster. You don't have to worry about lights and everything. So I said, no, it'll be faster if I run. So I keep running. I get there. Kids get the balls. We have a phenomenal camp session. So much fun. So then later that day, long story short, long story short, Coach Ross makes a call to Pat Summit. I think I'm about to get on a plane to go to Barcelona to go overseas. I get a call from Pat Summit. Hey, do you want to come Lady Vols and help us coach? We've heard a lot of good things about you. I may not have felt prepared for that at that moment, but I was able to just draw on what I had and said, this is what I have. Can you work with this? And she says, yes. So while I'm at Tennessee, I took a slight pay cut to go from Notre Dame to Tennessee. But Tennessee gave me a meal card and I got to eat in the cafeteria. A little tight, but I'm loving the preparation. Here I am, this little girl who just has dreams to just do a lot of fun things at Tennessee with Pat Summit, coaching. So for me, keeping my belly full was like, let me just work with what I got. I got $10, I'm gonna use it wisely. I'm gonna go to the grocery store and get a big box of oatmeal. And so I ate oatmeal for pretty much all of my meals. And if I felt like I had some extra money, I would get some bread and I'd have some toast. And I ate oatmeal and toast. And people would be like, oh my gosh, that's so horrible. I couldn't do that. I couldn't do that. If you want something, though it doesn't even seem like a sacrifice. It's just part of it. I was so happy to go to work every day. I wasn't thinking about food. And then when you travel on the road with the team, you got plenty of food. And then you get the homeboy to sneak you into the training table, and you got more food, right? And then you make friends with somebody else who invites you out to dinner, and then you get more food. There's plenty all around. There's, you don't have to depend on dollars for everything you need. Depend on relationships. And look for what? Look for what? Support. No, look for what? Opportunity. Opportunity. And my homeboy, who used to sleep me at a training table, is now an AD. He's an AD. And we still laugh and talk to this day. He's gone on to Duke. He's gone on to so many universities. He's amazing. But when you start and you grind with those people, the stories you have, and you know ZD as an athlete, the stories you have when you go through those trenches with those people. And then meanwhile, he's telling the same story about me. And now look at her. She was a GM and coach and blah, blah, blah. And now she has her consulting firm. And I'm as impressed with him as he is with me. And we celebrate and we laugh. Look where we came from. Look how we got here. We looked for opportunities. We supported each other. We believed in ourselves and we believed in each other. And where times got hard for me, I had a circle of friends, family, who'd be like, you got it. Don't worry about it. Maybe they give you $5 and you say thank you and that $5 is all you needed that day to do something different.
Amy Huber at PR News. You already said that, Danny. I don't know. You don't know we're always told to re-announce ourselves. Oh, thank you, Danny. I appreciate that. No problem. Um, how do you I actually do appreciate that, because I would have forgotten your name, so I do appreciate that. About names, too. Uh, how do you like to show gratitude for the people that have uh, supported you? Oh, my gosh. Right? Call, text, talk all the time. All the time. Thank you notes. I love sending thank you notes. I love texting, hey, I'm just thinking about you and that time. Like, I'll text um, Gerald when I leave here. Like, bro, I'm just thinking about you and our days back in Knoxville. And he'll get a good laugh. I appreciate you. And that's it. I just tell them. Every, when I see you, just tell them. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Dee Dee. Nice to meet you, Mr. Snyder. Most um, student athletes tend to hit a mental roadblock or a mental uh, slump. And I don't know if you did, but if you did, can you tell us how did you get out of that slump? Oh, sure did. Oh, my sophomore year was miserable. So my freshman year, I go, I go to University of Cincinnati. And my freshman year, I was, I was highly recruited. See, I feel like we're just talking. I, I forget I'm being interviewed. The way that she has you all set up is perfect because it allows me to feel like this is a conversation. And there's a difference. You guys don't get this everywhere. I go to speak a lot of different classes, and it feels more interviewee. And you guys are making this feel very comfortable. And your questions are deeper level. You're not asking me these, these basic questions. And I appreciate you have no idea how prepared Dr. Hawkins is getting you. Even the reintroduction of your name, she's getting you guys prepared to a very, very high level. So thank you. And please show your gratitude towards your professor. OK, so yes, sophomore year. So I get there. I get to um, college. And my, I remember my first practice thinking, Wait, practice is over. This is it? I thought it was supposed to be so tough. And I wasn't even barely breaking a sweat because I was in phenomenal conditioning. I made sure I was in great shape when I got there. So my freshman year, I ended up starting. Um, I came in. We were playing Xavier and we're losing. Coach puts me in. I scored 13 points in the second half. I, have, I remember shooting the shots I shot thinking, I mean, I honestly in my mind thought I was an All-American. <laughs> And I was just playing like it. Like, I was thinking, they need me, so I have to step up for my team, and we need to score. And I looked at the score, but I said, they need me to score. So I just started shooting, and they were just going in. So after that, I started the rest of the year as a freshman. So now you fast forward to my sophomore year. And I'm thinking, OK, now I know what I need to do. So I started. Um, working harder and trying to do more things, thinking, okay, I'm going to take more shots and do all of these things. Well, uh, the coach team brought in another freshman who was my same position. She had been a scorer her whole life. I was just morphing into a scorer at that phase, because prior to that, my claim to fame was just working hard. So I was trying to become a scorer and putting all my energy towards that, they bring in somebody who was a natural score. She scored over 2,000 points in high school. I didn't even get to 600 in high school. I'm mad that you laughed. <laughs> and so I would start the game, play like three minutes. And this wasn't every game, but you know when you're going through it, when you're feeling it, you feel like it's every game. I'd start, I'd get subbed out about maybe five minutes into the game, and sometimes I would sit and would not go back in. And this is back when they had halves, not quarters. Um, I would not go back in until the second half. And I'm sorry, there were quarters. I can't remember. Nevertheless, 
the toll that that took on me. I mean, it was devastating. I had never not played, ever. My, in high school, I did not get put on varsity as a freshman. I didn't even make JV as a freshman. I was on the freshman team as a freshman. But I played every minute of every game and took every shot. Well, every other shot. So then my sophomore year of high school, I started junior year, started senior year, I started. We ranked number one in the country, went to state three years in a row. It was amazing. So now you fast forward to the sophomore year, now I'm not playing. Never not played. And for anyone who's ever been an athlete, from going to play to not play, it's, it's, it does something to your whole sense of self. That's hard to really put into words. And then on top of that, I was also trying to add another dimension to my game or what I was bringing to the table. But then there was somebody in my position who was doing it. So then on top of that, there's college and there's life and there's social life and there's all these things coming. So how did I get through it? I stepped away from all of it. And I said, I need to go back to what I was doing as a child. And remember what I said as a child, what was I doing? I wanted to do everything. So I went from going from this person who had so many things they were interested in, church, music, art, computers, basketball, hanging with my friends, all these different things I would love to do, science, math. Oh, that was the other thing. I was also a math major and had failed anatomy, um, excuse me, had failed um, calculus and analytics geometry too. So I had to stop being a math major. So that was taken away from me. So I lost math. I, you know, you're a student athlete. You can't do all those other things you like doing. You pretty much it's just what. So I was so narrowly focused on these things that weren't resonating with what my soul enjoyed when I was a child. So I had to find something that I could draw back on from when I was a child that just made me happy. So I started just going to church more, not because I necessarily was interested in what was being said. I liked the music. And the music made me happy. Because as a child, we were in church all the time. And all my cousins can sing. And they would let me stand up there and act like I could sing. And sometimes they would tell me to just lip sync, but don't actually sing. But they're my cousins. And you know, when you're, they love you, so they're just being honest. So I started just doing those things that I just loved to do. And then I started running track. I asked the basketball coach, can I run track? And my basketball coach, what Lori Pirtle, was amazing. She looked at me, she says, I don't want you to do this. She says, but I see you're not happy. And I know you need to do something to get that fire back. So I started running track. And then I was also a track athlete at the University of Cincinnati. Just being outside, and this is what I love about track, you just get to be outside, running, pushing your body, laughing with your friends, trying new things. You get a lot of time to think, to be alone with your own thoughts. No headphones, take the headphones out. Don't listen, or if you need them in, try to listen to music without words, because that's somebody else's words. And the more you listen to somebody else's words, the less you can hear your own words, your own thoughts, your own feelings. Tune in within. So to get me through that slump, which was tough, oh, and to make it all worse, she was my roommate. <laughs> I know. Oh. And to make it all worse, just as you think it couldn't get any worse, and ask any of my teammates, I wish I could get one on the phone right now, they will tell you. She didn't like me. She didn't like me. We, there was so much tension in the dorm room. Oh, it was horrible. It was horrible. 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 <laughs> so I even asked the coach, I begged the coach to let me get another roommate. And she said no. She says no one on the team can tolerate her but you. I said, so the fact that I'm a patient person and I have a kind heart, I have to be with the most incredulous person on the team? And she said, yes, that's exactly what that means. So she said, remember, this is why we brought you here, because we loved your personality, you're a hard worker and a great leader. 
So that's what we need you to do. And here I am thinking they brought me in here to be a scorer. No, my job was to lead her. So once I started running track, it freed me up now also emotionally and had that tough conversation with my coach when I begged to trade rooms and they said, no, we need you to be a leader. This is why you're here. This is one of your gifts. So I was like, okay, now I'm stuck with her for the rest of the spring. How are we going to make this work? She liked Mahalia Jackson. I did not like, I, it's not that I didn't like, I wasn't familiar with Mahalia Jackson. So I said, okay, let me meet her where she is. So I went in the room one day, and I remember standing outside of my room, and one of the neighbors came by, he says, are you going in? And I said, Shh. I had to get my mind right to go open the door and go in my room and say, hey, can you play one of those Mahalia Jackson songs for me? Just to try to find a common ground with her. So the rest is history. She's an amazing person. And now she and I can laugh about those days. But at the time, no, no, baby, no, that was not happening. No, no. Does that? Wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Xander Hi, Xander. Is that with an X or a Z? Considering all the success and career expertise that you have, how does it feel to now be in a position to be someone who has the opportunity to believe in somebody else? You already are. You always have been. Who here has a family member that's living. Any. Who has one family? Okay, there. Believe in them. No matter who they are. My grandmother, till the day she passed, had, she passed the most beautiful way, by the way. So literally, up until the moment she passed, sitting at the kitchen table, looking out the window, which is why she wanted to. It's beautiful, beautiful story. So as she's sitting at the kitchen table, what does she want to do? She wants to get the fork from the plate to her mouth. Watch, because that shows that you doubt, you're not sure if she can do it. Enjoy your breakfast, and you turn around, and you stir her grits. And you believe, and there's a lot of different ways. Maybe it's verbally, maybe you say something. Maybe when she starts to go and she starts to struggle, you use words to show that you believe, right? Maybe you pat her on the back to show that you believe. But there's so many different ways you can show someone that you believe in them. And everyone has something they want to do. Your parents have goals. Can you believe that? Can you believe your parents actually have desires, have goals, have things they wish to achieve? Or how many of you think that, no, they don't. Their goal is for me. Probably all of you think that. <laughs> believe in them. My, my children are the best. Good luck today, mom. Kick butt, go have fun. Thanks, son. Good luck today to you too. Go kick butt, have fun. I say to my son all the time, ball out. He's like, Ugh. at school, yeah, dude, ball <laughs> out at school. In the classroom, everything you do, we ball out. That's what we do. Go, ball out. And he's like, you're weird. Yes, as are you, my king, ball out. Everything you do, encourage them. My mom called me yesterday. She's starting a new project. She goes, I'm starting a new project. This one's a big one. She hasn't done this before. 
you got it. She's like, aren't you surprised? Of course I'm not surprised, mom. It's you. My mom can do writing well don't worry about the punctuation ma i got it you just write leave the punctuation to me just write write from your soul write from your heart my sister is phenomenal at editing concepts and restructuring sentences so then we'll pass it on to her and she'll do that and my brother who's an engineer is very analytical and he may say, okay, this I don't understand. So you may want to add two more sentences here that maybe make it more clear to linear thinkers, which sometimes happens in a lot of men. So we all bring something to the table to help her get what she wants to accomplish. And then she takes that all and packages it up and goes out there and knocks it out the park. When I my, used to think my mom had nothing to bring to the table for me for my sports. And one day after a game, I came out of the locker room and we had lost. And I was ruminating in my head, what could I have done more to help the team? Because remember, at that point, my mentality had shifted and I really went back to embracing what had got me there to begin with, which was leadership. And how can I lead this team? And the more I embraced that leadership, I ended up my junior, senior year having phenomenal years. I didn't even think about scoring points. All I thought was, how do I get my teammates to do what needs to be done. I became the coach on the court. And I played, I had started, I played tons of minutes. They couldn't take me off the court. And I didn't want to be off the court. And I got yelled at one day so bad by my coach because I wasn't practicing. And the coach said, we can't practice if Am's not going to practice. Because nothing's right when you're not on the court. So I was like, well, why am I getting yelled at? But that's just what coaches do. So what got you there, what people believed in you for, is what keeps you there and then takes you to the next level. Something got you to be here today. What went into your story to get you here today? What things, what gifts about yourself did you exhibit that opened up doors? Right before that big call from Ball State, is this your first school? Second. There you go. Where were you before? Illinois. Yep, that's right. Mm hmm Shot clock? No, Maria Williams, Uh Since you are a woman who has been in the sports field a long time, I have three women for me because I want them to be forceful, accomplished by the time they leave here. What can you tell them that will make them push harder and go farther? Great question. <clears throat> Confidence to me comes with is going back to what we started to, to me confidence is a product of it doesn't just happen be like have confidence okay well what goes into that right coach prime this is my dude y'all have no idea and this goes way back before he was coach prime he used to say and it's probably still does i don't follow it enough to know when you look good you feel good. When you feel good, you play good. When you play good, they pay good. So don't talk to him about his chains or his shades or what else he's doing. He's doing what he has to do to get his mind and his whole being in alignment with the feeling of good. And then he can take that good and transmute it and alchemize it into great. 
that's what I got from him when I was in high school. So now, how do you feel good before you go into this interview or this situation where you need to have this confidence? Here's the three girls right here, right? Okay. How do you do that? What do you need to do? So then channel back to, okay, when are times where you do feel really confident? When are times you do feel good? Do you ever go out to dinner? Have you ever gone on vacation? Okay. Would you go out to, let's say, I don't know, a concert? Has anybody been to a concert recently? Oh, great, you all have. Okay. You go to that conf concert, you want to have a good time, you want to look good, and you want to feel good, right? Okay, whatever you do to get ready for that concert, that's what you do before an interview. Period. It's pre-game. It's pre-game. My son, my poor children, I love them, and I feel so bad for them sometimes that they're stuck with me as their mother. My son always complains that I play the music too loud. I said, do get earplugs. I got you earplugs. Put the earplugs in. I gotta, this is, I'm gotta get in the zone. I have work to do. So I do TV, so like yesterday, big game, Baylor versus Cincinnati. So before the game, I got my music on, and my son's like hollering, 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 and by now he's learned this is my locker room, right? I don't have a locker room, so my house, right? My dressing room becomes my locker room. I play my music, I get my mind right, I have the Baylor game on, some old games, so I'm tuning into with what I'm about to go do. Because when you get to the arena, what happens? You sit down, you gotta do the broadcasting, what's going on, there's the fans, there's the music. So I try to prepare in that same type of environment, right? So I have a lot of music going, I have a game going, you know, getting dressed, doing my hair, and just taking my time so I can feel good. And my kids laugh, they said, we can't tell if you're getting ready to go to church, getting ready for a game, or getting ready to go out with your friends. Because my feel good prep is the same. It might be Kirk Franklin, John P. Key, and Bob Marley, all on that soundtrack, and then followed up by an hour of cello instrumental. Right? And then to wrap it all up, it might be 45 minutes of mantra meditative music. Who knows? Who knows? But it's whatever you, I need to do to feel good. So if you go into that interview or you go into that space and you're not already feeling good, it's a wrap. It's done. It's done. Unless you now learn how to have that extra battery pack when you're not prepared. So you go, okay, well, when have I needed to do something and had to kick it into high gear before and I wasn't quite ready? Have you ever been at an airport and you suddenly get there and you realize you're late and you have to figure out how to get to that gate? You have to dig in deep and kick it into gear and to figure out, okay, we're all getting off of this tram and I gotta figure out how to navigate myself around all these people to get to the front of the elevator so I can run up the elevator so then I can get skinny through that thing, maybe duck under there and get to my gate. You, you just gotta figure it out, right? Yes? Or are you one of those people who says, oh, I'm gonna be late, never mind. Today's just not my day. Nothing good ever happens for me. I'm always, like, it's your choice. So when you have those experiences and you put them in your back pocket of knowing how to kick in and having to tap in to something within you that can bring that out, then when you get in those situations, okay, maybe I'm not completely prepared, but maybe I've learned from Dr. Hawkins how to ask that one question, and that's the one question I'm confident in. I have a partner, a uh, broadcasting partner that I work with, and Lord knows this dude asks the most silliest questions, and he knows it too, and I love working with him. He actually might be, and then I have another one I work with who asks the best questions. So when we show up for interviews together, one of the play-by-play, -play, so the play-by-play -play and the analysts usually do the interviews together, okay? So try to make sure that, if, is anybody in here interested? Okay. Analysts and play-by-play -play should do the interviews together when possible. Usually the producer will arrange them. If the producer doesn't arrange them, usually the director will arrange them. If the director doesn't, then it's usually the play-by-play. Play-by-play, -play, who's here, anyone interested in play-by-play? -play? Okay, be prepared to always take the lead because quite often you're going to be the most informed person in the room. You're gonna know the teams the best, 
and you're going to know the backdrop the best. You're also going to usually be the person who has the most opportunity to interact with people on staffs. So you're going to know the pulse of, uh, anyone else just play by play only C3? Okay, you're going to know the pulse of the teams and learn them, learn what they like, learn who they are, get phone numbers, get exchange, develop relationships with the sports information directors, PR, all the support staff, because that's your key. And they give all the information, all the goods, even the off the record stuff. And people often talk more when you put your laptops away. And this has been so difficult for me to do interviews and interview coaches and stuff without having my notes out. But they talk more and they say more. And ask them directly, is this, and if they say something sensitive, on the record or off? And they'll say, oh, off. Cool. Know that and keep it off. Or else they will not talk to you anymore. Should not. Or you'll start getting dry information. One word answers, two word answers, right? So the more welcoming you are, the more welcoming the other person's going to be. How people respond to you, how you come off to them. So if you come off unprepared, they're not interested in conversing with you. How many of you, I'm going to get back to the girls in a second about being confident. How many of you know, you've mentioned GM, head coach. Is shot clock's on? How much time do we have? We're over time now. Oh, I'm sorry. pleasure. So much fun. Thank you for joining us. I thank you. And thank you, Dr. Maria. Thank you, Dr. Hawkins, for the invitation.